Hello everyone and welcome to our Sustainable House Day expert session on insulation and energy efficiency. Thank you so much for joining us. First, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the stolen lands of many First Nations peoples. I am speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We would like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. If you like, feel free to share which Aboriginal land you are watching from in the chat with us. Uh, before the webinar begins, I would just like to tell you a little bit about Sustainable House Day and about Renew. Sustainable House Day is a national event that gives you access to Australia's most sustainable homes. This year, we are offering four themed weeks of online and in-person events around the country leading up to Sustainable House Day on October 17th, when we'll host a day of free online sessions with our homeowners. This week is our retrofitting week where we'll discuss what you can do to improve the sustainability of existing homes. You can visit sustainablehouseday.com to see detailed house profiles and tour videos for the 130 homes we have open this year and to book for our upcoming events. Sustainable House Day is organized by Renew. We're a not-for-profit that inspires, enables, and advocates for people to live sustainably in their homes and communities. You can find out more about Renew at renew.org.au. So tonight's session, we will begin with expert presentations and then we'll move on to a Q&A session. You can ask questions at any point during the webinar this evening using Zoom's Q&A function, which you can find in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A and not the chat to ask questions. Feel free to use the chat to share thoughts or links if that's something that you would like to do. Uh, now I would like to hand over to our MC for this evening, Dean Lombard. Thanks Sophie and welcome everybody. It's great to be here and that there's so many people. Um, a quick overview of how the session is gonna run. We've got two uh, presentations from our expert panelists. Uh, they'll go for about half an hour each. After that, we'll introduce some other panelists who are people who've got their homes in Sustainable House Day on the website for you to look at. Uh, they'll talk a little bit about themselves and then we'll go into the Q&A session. If you've, if you've got questions during the presentations, pop them in the Q&A and we'll take questions from the Q&A and I'll read them out and put them to the panelists. So that's pretty much how it runs. Uh, we've got an hour for questions in the Q&A section. Uh, so to start with, I'll introduce our first expert panelist, and that's Wendy Miller, Associate Professor of Engineering at the Queensland University of Technology. Wendy initiates and conducts industry and government funded socio-technical research in energy efficiency, renewable energy and resilience in the built environment, with a particular focus on housing. Current projects include resilient cooling, living laboratories, electronic building passports, building regulation and compliance, natural ventilation, indoor environment quality. She's especially interested in the rise of prosumers and what this means to energy policy regulations and markets. She's done past research, research projects on manufactured housing and sustainable housing, national climate change adaptation research on housing and heat waves, industry funded research on the impact of cool roof coatings for cooling loads in subtropical and tropical buildings, and post-occupancy performance assessment of subtropical and tropical housing. And Wendy's gonna to talk to us today about energy efficiency and resilience. So take it away, Wendy. Great, thanks, thanks, Dean. Um, I'll just share my screen. Hopefully you can see that now. Um, gee, that sounds really busy. I've been working on this on these things for quite a while and I think it's about time I retire and pass the baton on to somebody else. Um, having said, so today I do want to speak about particularly the why, where, what and how of insulation. But as I do so, I want to, to keep in mind because we're sort of all over the country that my personal and professional experience is predominantly in subtropical and tropical climates. So um, not all the things that um, I say are important uh, from what we've found in research and in practice may not necessarily be exactly right for your particular context. And we'll talk about that as we look at climate, um, the importance of climate later as well. But to introduce myself uh, a little bit, um, so my family has been a member of Renew or previously the ATA for several decades now, I think three and a bit. 
and we've um, organised and hosted Sustainable House Day uh, several times in the past. And I've modified this cartoon to reflect our household situation. So uh, we're self-sufficient in our home for electricity and for water. Um, we are connected to the electricity grid, but not to any water or stormwater um, connections other than a local community one. We do grow a fair bit of our own fruit and vegetables. Uh, we use rainwater for cooking and bathing and recycled water for toilet and garden use. We have solar energy for electricity, for charging our batteries and for hot water. We do have chickens who um, provide a lot of services to us, including eggs and fertiliser but we don't eat our chickens when they um, are past their laying stage. So we don't require Henrietta to go to the shop to, to buy some eggs so that she doesn't um, get passed over. So why do we have insulation? We have buildings in order uh, to protect us and our goods, I guess, and our belongings from the external environment. And sometimes a rudimentary shelter itself is not enough. To, um, to protect us. It can still be too hot or too cold or too humid or too windy inside. So we add insulation to make a better indoor environment. In general terms, the greater the temperature difference between the outside climate and your desired internal climate, the more insulation you will need. And it, again, in general terms, the first place to address would be the roof because in Australian homes, that's typically the largest surface area that's exposed to the sun because the sun's high in the sky where we are. So if I had to summarise this talk in one slide, this would be it. It's that we have insulation to reduce heat transfer into and out of the house. And the direction of that heat transfer depends on where is the hottest place. Heat will always travel from the hotter place to the colder place. So if it's hot outside and cold inside, the heat is trying to get in. If you've warmed up your house in winter, the heat is trying to get out. Where should insulation be placed? As I mentioned, my two key things are um, from top to bottom and from outside to inside. That's particularly important in hot climates. Um, it may be a little different in cold climates. What type of insulation really depends on the climate, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. And um, in general, R value is more important than the actual physical type, in my opinion, but there might be other considerations that come into play, such as embodied energy, whether it's made locally, um, some of the other life cycle assessment things, et cetera. And how insulation should be installed is a pretty simple concept. It should cover the entire space that you want insulated. It should be continuous with no gaps. It should be installed as provided, that is not squashed and not thinned out to make it go further. And insulation is only one part of a system of creating an energy efficient and comfortable house. You also have to think of a lot of other things. So there's some of the things that we'll be looking at today. So the first is, um, understanding what your climate is. So there are a range of atmospheric conditions that uh, we need to consider when we're building uh, our home and living in a home, and that's solar radiation, winds, temperature, humidity, etc. All of those things have an impact on heat transfer and on um, your ability to um, harvest energy from the sun for your hot water or for your electricity. Then there's all, we also need to understand each of those things in a number of time scales, from minutes, hours, days, weeks, and seasons, to years, decades, and in the long term, we should really also be thinking of centuries. So what does that mean in practice? So this is a table that's taken from the Bureau of Meteorology for um, Climate Zone 9, which is Amberley, uh, climate Zone 9 in the National Home Energy House Energy Rating Scheme. So this is for Amberley in southeast Queensland. And it is a, a typical way of presenting information. It presents the mean temperature, rainfall, sunshine hours, relative humidity, et cetera, for each of the months of the year over a particular time period. But we, as people and our houses don't live 
in mean conditions. We experience the minimums and the maximums, the extremes of temperature and the, the duration of different temperature bands. We experience the extremes of rainfall intensity of, of wind and of relative humidity, et cetera. So this type of information in itself is not sufficient to design a really good house. We need to understand the temperature much more. And some of that understanding can be gained from some of the software tools, for example, that are um, accredited under the Nationwide House Energy Rating Scheme or NATHERS that are used for providing a star rating for houses under the um, National Construction Code. So this picture on the right, for example, shows the distribution of temperatures in this same climate zone nine, so Amberley, um, west, west of Brisbane. Um, so, so from January, um, you know, the temperatures typically range from around about 20 up to, up to almost the mid thirties. And in July from five up to sort of around the 23 or so. So our houses have to be able to cope in this particular climate, for example, with a range from a minimum of around about five or where I am, it's actually around the zero up to um, in extremes up to 40 degrees because this graph is only showing mean maximums and minimums for each month and not the extremes. So in my particular climate zone, which is somewhat the closest climate zone would, would be this climate, we actually have to have a house that can manage from zero to 40 degrees. And some other things that we need that are helpful in understanding a climate might be heating degree and cooling degree days. And you can find information about what that means um, at the Bureau of Meteorology. But in essence, it's the number of days in the year that might be below 18 degrees or above 24 degrees. And they could arguably be considered the, the number of days where you might um, potentially want to use mechanical heating or cooling. But it also depends on what your actual um, personal requirements are regarding comfort. Um, it also depends on what sort of climate information you're using. So under the current NATHERS scheme for the energy rating of houses, they're using a, a typical, what's called a TMY file or a typical meteorological year, which is the average monthly temperatures for a period ranging from 1970 to 2005. Next year, when the uh, building codes change again, the, the files will range from 1990 to 2015. But that doesn't tell you how your house is going to perform if you build a house this year and how is it going to perform in 2030, 2040, 2050, when we know that the climate is changing. So aside from those particular climate things, we also need to know the microclimate conditions of your specific site. So, um, is it on the top of a hill and therefore is in, is in a very windy position? Is it on a large suburban block? Is it on a smaller suburban block and surrounded by buildings and therefore you don't get much, um, much breeze? So an example of that um, we, found, uh, we found when we were doing some research on uh, Springfield Lakes, which is a, a um, residential development to the west of Ipswich, west of Brisbane, um, so this residential development is about 30 kilometres east of the Amberley um, weather station. So in this table um, in a heat wave period in 2012, we have the minimum and maximum temperatures exhibited for the Bureau of Meteorology at Amberley and those minimum and maximum temperatures that we measured in this housing estate that was fairly close to it. And typically the uh, minimum temperatures during the heat wave were about four degrees hotter than the weather bureau was saying, and the maximum temperatures were two or three degrees hotter. And also the, the, um, the afternoon temperatures, um, the, how the hot temperatures um, evolved over the day was also quite different. That um, by mid afternoon, the, um, the temperatures in the housing estate were quite a bit different to what they were at the airport. And the main reason for that, um, well, a lot of the Bureau of Meteorology 
where the climate data is taken at airports where it's fairly open ground um, lots of, and can be more breezes, et cetera, than in suburbia. And then in this particular housing estate, a lot of what's called the urban heat island effect where um, the lots were quite small. Uh, so a lot of the land mass was taken up by the roads, the footpaths, the uh, tiled roofs and a fair few brick buildings. Uh, so all soaking up the heat and then re-radiating that heat um, in the surrounding houses. So what we really need to do in order to optimise the performance of our building, both in terms of energy and in terms of our indoor environment quality, so our health and our comfort, is to be able to optimise all of these things, the geometry of the house, the building envelope, which is where the insulation comes in, you know, what uh, comfort uh, you need. We need to make sure that the envelope and the geometry provide us with good daylight, but, um, but without letting in too much heat. And then we need the energy systems in order to run those things. And I'll be showing you what we did in our house, in essence, to try to meet those things for our climate. So what are we actually trying to do? As said before, we're really trying to control heat flow and insulation is one of those things, but it's not the only thing that relates to controlling heat flow. We also need to control how the sun hits the materials that our house is made of because heat will travel through those materials uh, to varying degrees. Um, we also need to control the airflow because that a, can help or uh, prevent our thermal comfort, but it can also decrease the, uh, the use or the properties of insulation if it's not done very carefully. So each of the materials that are used in a house have particular properties, and those properties relate to some of the key things about those materials. So for insulation, the main property that we use is thermal resistance. So, uh, so that's the R value. So the R value is a rating of how much does this material resist the transfer of heat from one side of the material to the other side of the material. And it is really related to all the air gaps that are in the material itself. A few things to keep in mind, um, when looking at insulation. So we have bulk insulation, so that might be your, your, all your bats, your wool bats, your polyester bats. It might be your, um, your cellulose fibre. It might be rigid uh, foam, etc. So all of your bulk insulation is rated in a, is given its R value based on the thermal resistance of that product by itself. Whereas other insulation products, such as reflective foil products, any of the foil type products, they're not rated on the product itself. They're rated on how that product is used in a system. So um, a, a wool, woolen bat, for example, might have an R4 for a particular thickness, whereas a reflective foil might say it's an R2.5 but it's not the foil that's two and a half. It's you have to read the fine print, which says if you have such and such external wall and then an air gap and then foil and then an air gap and then your internal wall, the total R value of that system is R two and a half. So it's really important that you understand the difference to how the two top broad types of insulation are actually rated in Australia. And also understand that um, if you're with a designer or a builder who says the, the building code, the National Construction Code says you only need R2.5 or R4 or whatever it is in a particular situation, keep in mind that the building codes only represent minimum requirements based on assumptions of the cost of insulation and the cost of energy. They are not the best design things. Um, so keep that in mind. The building codes are not presenting best practice um, and, far, and far from it. So some examples of that uh, we did in some research that we did in Townsville. So this, um, so if you look at the, the line that's labeled number one with the blue arrow, 
These are the outdoor ambient uh, temperature data for Townsville that's used for the simulation tools that in essence say that 82% of the time of the year, 82% of the year in Townsville, the temperature is between 20 and 30 degrees. It actually has more uh, percentage of time underneath 20 degrees than what it does over 31 degrees. And that's a bit surprising people find um, for a tropical place. So what we wanted to know is, does it, what, um, what difference does it make depending on what type of insulation you put where and what type of roof you put on a house in Townsville? So if we look at the two arrows that are yellow arrows, the two yellow arrows, they are for ceiling insulation, so bulk insulation of R2 and a half or R1 and a half in a roof that does not have any foil insulation underneath the roof itself. Uh, no building blanket, for example, which is allowed in Townsville. And it has a roof color that's a medium color that reflects about 50% of the solar radiation. And for both of those circumstances, regardless of whether you have R2 and a half or R1 and a half on your ceiling in a Townsville house, of a medium color roof, about a quarter of the year, the roof cavity will be over 36 degrees. And some people think, well, so what, what does that matter because we're not living in the roof cavity? And it matters because of the way that insulation is, um, is rated in Australia. So it's rated at two and a half, uh, at R two and a half, if it's in a temperature of 24 degrees. So if it's at a temperature of 36 degrees, it is not, it is not, it is no longer an R2 and a half. It actually decreases its thermal resistance the hotter it gets. And all bulk insulation materials do this. The other um, thing is that the effectiveness of the insulation changes, the greater the difference is between the temperature on one side of the insulation and the temperature on the other side of the insulation. So in the testing of insulation, it, it rates the insulation with a six degree difference, a 12 degree or an 18 degree difference. But in a tropical climate, your, if your, um, your roof cavity can often be at 50 degrees, for example, and if you're running your aircon inside at 25 degrees, that temperature difference between one side of your ceiling insulation and the other is over 25 degrees. And you certainly won't be getting the um, effect of an R2 and a half insulation. What can we do to change that? So the green arrows that are no labeled number three, keep us at the same insulation level for the ceiling and in the first one, it doesn't put foil under the roof, but it changes the color of the roof. So it goes from a medium color to let's say a light cream color, which reflects 80% of the solar radiation. If you follow that line across, you can see straight away, you dramatically reduce the number of hours that the roof cavity will be at will be um, over 36 degrees. And which will then make your insulation work better. Still better yet is if you then also put foil or building blanket um, underneath the roof, as well as the bulk insulation on the ceiling with the same cream colored roof, you would get no hours over 36 degrees. And the best solution is uh, for this particular uh, style house. So it was a, a hip roof house, um, brick veneer. Um, is to you could have an R two and a half insulation on your ceiling, foil under the roof, and a really light coloured roof. Uh, so ninety percent is about the at the time was the the best solar reflected paint you could get on the market, and you could eliminate the number of hours that your roof cavity is at thirty six degrees. So they're just some examples of. Um, in this instance, we were using the simulation software to be able to show um, the resident of the house. We we're also measuring the temperatures in this house to show them the different options they had for being able to 
provide a, um, a, more, a house that was more comfortable whilst using a lot less um, air conditioning energy. So this is um, an example of, of how that happens. So when the sun shines on the roof, the surface of the roof will reflect some of that radiation. Some of that radiation will conduct through the material and get into the air gap underneath the roof, which then will re-radiate um, down through the insulation um, and then in, into the house itself. So that's why, in particularly in hot climates, starting from the top to the bottom, so starting from the outer surface of the roof to then a, a foil type insulation underneath, then your, your bats and something in the ceiling. And it can be as simple in tropical climates as choosing the color of your roof. And this graph on the, on the right is from the Australian standards that, that shows that at about 24 degrees, um, the bulk insulation things are, get their 100% R value rating. The hotter the temperature, the um, less effective the um, bulk insulation is. On the other hand, the colder the temperature, some of the, um, some of the insulation bats work better than others, the colder it gets. So, um, so you might, for example, sheep's wool, um, wool insulation might be a really good choice in a cold climate, um, whereas the cellulose or rock wool don't lose quite as much uh, in a hotter climate. I hope that sort of makes, makes sense. Then the how of installing things is also really important, um, that there should be no gaps. This is a picture we took of uh, one of the houses that was one of our case studies, where um, the builder ordered 450 uh, mil wide insulation, but the, but the gap between the, the joist was, the uh, roof rafters was actually 600. So he installed it like that. We went into the house and did some thermal imaging and found all the gaps and the builder had to make good on this particular situation and it cost him about $15,000 to remove the PV systems, remove the solar hot water systems, remove the, the roofing material, put in the new insulation because part of this was also a um, cathedral roof um, and make good for the customer. These other pictures are from other houses that show that often insulation is not installed really well at the corners of hip roofs um, and also on this bottom picture, it seems to show that there was insulation, there was meant to be insulation, uh, bulk insulation in all the walls as well. But it seems that that insulation has probably slumped down because it wasn't a, a tight fit sort of between, um, between the wall framing materials. So it seems now that a lot of these walls, the tops of the walls are not done. This image in the middle is also showing that, um, that sections close to wall joints are often not well insulated because insulation might be the last thing that the builder wants to do. He sends one of his apprentices up and they can't physically get to it anymore um, because of the, the angle of the roof. Then the top image is, is, a, is a bit vague, but in essence, it was showing that often in at least Queensland houses, there is often no insulation put in the area of the wall above door and window frames. Um, so there's obviously there's insulation here on the ceiling, but there's nothing above these um, door and window frames on the lower part of the picture. Um, so just want to quickly then show what we did in our house. So we live in the southern Gold Coast in the land of the Ugumbo people. Um, our house is what's called a mixed mode or a mixed weight house. So all of our thermal mass is inside and there is these um, rammed earth walls and we use lightweight materials, so structural insulated panels for our external walls and roof. So our roof is um, steel uh, both sides uh, with polyurethane R4.6, and the walls are fibre cement both sides with polyurethane through R3.5. We have fibre cement um, skirting um, subfloors uh, to cover this, this space um, and also some subfloor insulation. So these are just a few pictures. So our goal was to try, so the house is a nine star house uh, built in 2008. Um, and we've been monitoring it ever since to see what went well, what didn't go so well and what we can do about it. So these are pictures of the structural insulated panels. So the general 
benefits of these types of panels uh, from an insulation point of view is that usually there's a tenuous insulation, there's no gaps. From a material perspective, the panels are your external material, your framing, your insulation, and your internal wall, wall finish all in one product. So it's a lot less um, materials, but it's not without its problems. Um, in our particular case, uh, here are our, you might be able to see the wall material and the tops of the walls are capped with a steel channel uh, in which to attach the roof to. That steel channel um, conducts heat through into the house, only a small amount, but nevertheless, it still pre presents a thermal bridge. The other thing we found in this house, we have a small section of wall that um, indicates a change of roof height in the house. And it, uh, we couldn't use the panels for that. So it's just standard framed and insulated only to about an R2 when it, according to the code, it should really have been insulated to the same level as the roof because it is more related to the roof than to the external wall. Uh, subfloor insulation is a tricky thing that we still haven't resolved fully because it's access issues. How do you, how do you get to insulate the subfloor? How do you deal with your services that need to run underneath the house? And how do you deal with rodents? Uh, we just buried a rat today. And uh, other native inhabitants, such as our, um, our pet snake here. But it's only insulation is only part. We also need to be uh, really cognizant of, of uh, shading. Uh, so we've done a number of things here of, um, tinting western windows and having a, a movable shade, making sure the eaves in our uh, particular latitude, 900 millimetre eaves are required as a minimum all around the house to make sure that you don't get any sun on the walls of the house from mid-September to early April. So all of some of the, all the walls are fully shaded and they get full sun from May, from May to August to allow the um, sun to heat us in winter. And windows are also really important for us for a number of reasons. So we use uh, recycled casement, wooden casement windows to capture breezes that would have flown past the house. A lot of louvers to capture any breezes that are directly onto the house. And also louvers at the highest part of the ceiling to allow for uh, hot air to escape. Um, the house performs really well. We have 96% of the year. Our temperatures naturally are 18 to 28 degrees. We have no heaters, no air conditioners. We have uh, ceiling fans for really hot days. We have um, Ugg boots and a jumper when it gets down to 18, 17, 16, sometimes for a few hours. But we do have problems because of the changing, uh, future challenges because of the changing climate. We have had a couple of heat waves in the last few years um, in August, September, when there's still sun on the walls of the house. Uh, we have longer hot weather in summer and the internal thermal mass does a good job up to about three or four days. After that, it gets a bit tricky to try to cool it overnight, particularly when our overnight temperatures are getting hot. So that's in, in a nutshell for me. And I just want to leave you with a picture um, from a colleague in Germany of mine where they actually have to... Um, display the, the energy efficiency of their houses or their apartments before they can, uh, every year, as well as when they sell or, or lease land. Um, so how much does yours do to a square metre? And I'd like to see that in Australia. Uh, so thanks, thanks for listening. And um, back to you, Dean. Thanks, Randy. That was really interesting. Uh, and you've inspired a heap of questions that we'll get to in the second half of the session. Um, but before that, we will go on to our next presenter. Uh, it's Ben Kane. Ben is founder and architect at Lean House. After 12 years at top tier design, construction and property development forms, firms, Ben saw the need to create a better method of delivering great design and high performance for more than just the top 1%. By adopting lean design and construction, his, their designs can allow more people to live healthy, low impact lives. Ben's past commercial projects have been highly awarded by the Institute of Architects, and he's also a past counsellor of the Australian Institute of Architects in WA and a regular juror for the AIA Awards. So I'll, with no further ado, I'll pass on to Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thanks so much, Dean. And um, thank you, Wendy, for providing such a thorough um, background. 
into insulation and um, building performance, which allows me to get a little bit into the nitty gritty of a problem we've been trying to solve. So I'll just um, start my presentation here. Um, so we, yeah, my, my specialty here in, in Perth is to offer, you know, more cost-effective architecture that also achieves high performance. So I generally try and um, offer clients three levels of performance, depending on their budget and I suppose their level of interest. Um, so what I call eco house is effectively a minimum seven star home. Um, the lean house is a, an airtight passive house like home, but not certified. And of course, we can also offer certified passive house and clients generally go for lean house. I haven't yet to do a non um, airtight home since the business started. And, um, you know, maybe one in 10 clients opt to go for the full certification route for passive house. Um, I should also mention that um, primarily my business is in new homes and we primarily work in timber framing. And the reason is that um, it's very difficult to achieve a passive house with a brick home. It's a pretty archaic material. Um, the timber is fantastic from a sustainability point of view. We all know and understand that. Um, it also has very low, low thermal bridging. And uh, so I'm just going to put the timer on. And um, lower, um, lower sort of barriers to getting the job done because it's not a, a specific technology. It's very common. There's lots of carpenters out there. There's lots of places you can order timber framing from. Um, we find it, it provides the lowest barrier to providing a home of this standard. So we're all in with timber and wherever possible, we remove the need for any kind of structural steel, which then needs to be, you know, carefully detailed to minimize thermal bridging. So we, um, Wendy already provided a great background on insulation and the primary sort of um, discussion was around thermal resistance, which is R value. And in generally, you know, wall systems, we, we're trying to achieve a larger R value number. Um, in the passive house world, um, generally, components are rated with regard to their U value figure. And that's actually the inverse of R value. So we're looking to get these, um, lower values um, in our components for U value. Um, but there's another um, aspect to our materials that is not well publicized and not often discussed and that's specific heat capacity. And so that's where I'm primarily talking about today. Um, because specific heat capacity um, has a massive impact on how long it takes for heat to travel through a material. And it's not considered in passive house. Um, and I kind of stumbled upon this figure when I was trying to understand why our homes um, that were rating well in passive house um, and had high levels of insulation, but they were still suffering um, overheating. So what is specific heat capacity? Well, it's basically, it's, a, it's how much heat is required to elevate the temperature um, of something on the other side of the material. And it's measured in joules uh, Kelvin. So um, a higher figure is better. Um, other, some products um, have a higher specific heat capacity, but they also have a, um, uh, low thermal resistance. Um, so what we're looking for is products that have a great balance between um, low thermal resistance and a high specific heat capacity. And this is important because it contributes to what is known as phase shift. And phase shift is the time difference between um, a temperature, say on the outside of the house, reaching the inside of the house. And what we really wanna do is we wanna spread out that or delay um, it, the time it takes for temperatures to travel through your building fabric. For example, this diagram here is showing a phase shift of 8.2 hours. And that effectively means that when you get the hottest part of the day, at say two or three o'clock, you're not really experiencing those hottest, hotter temperatures until later at night, by which stage the external temperatures have started to drop again. Whereas if your thermal um, envelope um, only has say a phase shift of uh, three hours, then um, by 6 or 7 p.m. you're experiencing well and truly the heat of the day because um, it's only taking a few hours to pass through the building envelope. 
So effectively, what we discover is that the R value of the wall system is not enough to ensure that your home is well insulated. An example is in Perth that we've, um, we were typically doing homes with um, 120 mil stud walls, um, R3 mineral uh, fiber insulation, which is well in excess of what would be considered normal. And when we were running them through our PHPP software, we were getting um, very good low percentages of overheating in PHPP software. So for example, we might get 0% or you know, single digit percentage of overheating and overheating is considered uh, over 25 de degrees. Um, however, what we're finding is that the homes will still get hot because of a very short phase shift in the wall system. And so ideally, I mentioned this, we're looking for products of insulation that has low, low thermal conductivity, but with high specific heat capacity. So these are some of the options we looked at. And as I mentioned, you know, we're really trying to provide our clients with bang for buck in, ter in terms of performance. Um, and it was very important to find products that um, are practical and affordable, but also provide good performance. So glass mineral wool or glass fiber is considered basically the standard in WA. I'm not sure about the other parts of the world. And it's very kind of difficult or you know starts getting expensive to deviate from um, using bulk insulation uh, that's mirror wall and as you can see by my highlighted figure here the specific heat capacity is typically um, around a thousand joules per kilogram kelvin now bearing in mind that um, most of the products that are available here your um, bradford's or earth wool or any of those products they don't actually um, advertise or um, note the specific heat capacity of their products. Um, I've actually spoken to their technical specialists and they um, don't even know what specific heat capacity is. So there seems to be, even in the insulation um, product industry, there seems to be this complete um, absence of knowledge or understanding of how important this factor is and how it contributes to phase shift. The figures I actually got here were from a um, a, a science website and glass fiber uh, mineral wool can actually have a huge difference in density too. So your typical product might be say 10 kilos per cubic meter and some specialist high density product can go as high as 20 kilos per cubic meter. And that can have a huge difference in the, the phase shift performance of the home. But, you know, it's very hard to beat mineral wool. It's very cheap. It's abundant. Everyone knows how to put it in. Um, in many cases, it's, it's, you know, consists of a high amount of uh, recycled content. So um, it's a pretty safe choice. It's just a case of um, understanding its limitations. So here's a typical wall system um, um, that we've been doing. Um, 120 millimeter stud with uh, service cavities um, in and out. And in that 120 millimeter stud, we would um, uh, put R3 insulation. And you can see here from the diagram on the right, the phase shift um, values spinning out of our calculator um, are showing four hours. Now that's certainly a lot better than a typical 90 mil uh, framed wall with say R2 in it. But from my point of view, I think we want to try and find something that does better, that does not necessarily cost a lot more. Um, so we started looking at um, thickening up the structure and we found that the co cost to go from say 120 mil stud to 170 mil stud was not actually that great. And what we can start doing then is putting um, more insulation into that and um, we actually used two 90 millimeter bats to give us a combined 180. Um, it puffs out a little bit either side, but if, even if you're sort of measuring the 170 millimeters of insulation, we're getting an improved phase shift of 4.7. Then some manufacturers actually provide um, what they call a high performance or an HD high density glass wall product. Um, once again, you've got to actually kind of dig down to figure out what the density of the product actually is. And when I plug that into the, um, the wall system calculator, you can see that my phase shift figures are increasing um, significantly. We're at 5.7 um, hours versus where we started at 4.1. 4 so we've already seen a 50% increase in performance for, for phase shift. 
Um, and we haven't spent a lot of extra money to get that. Other options are EPS, so expanded polystyrene, and there's certain products out there that you would uh, fix to your stud frame. Now, this actually has an improved specific heat capacity. Um, it's actually quite easy to get quite high performance homes when you line um, your structure with this. You just need to consider, you know, you're finishing externally. Um, is it the sort of look you want, whether it's rendered? Are you going to clad it? Um, it's not particularly environmentally sensitive. Um, in, in terms of its manufacture, but also end of life, what's going to happen to all that EPS when the house gets torn down. So it's not something we really like to do, but it does prove to be quite cost effective, particularly if a client's going for a rendered sort of look externally. Here's the calculations for this particular product. So a 90 mil stud, um, assuming no insulation in, in the actual stud frame itself and all the insulation is external. Um, we're achieving a, in, uh, a phase shift of 5.4 hours. Um, wool is actually a fantastic product. It's a byproduct of um, obviously agriculture. Not all wool is good enough to end up in clothing. Um, um, so the wool that ends up in insulation is typically a waste product and has a fantastic um, specific heat capacity. You can see here it's almost double of what mineral wool is. The biggest problem I found in Australia, in Western Australia, is that uh, the industries that produce wool are basically gone. Um, we had a huge wool, we, we do have a huge wool and sheep industry in Western Australia, but no one is producing the insulation anymore. And when I looked at whether it's possible to get it from New Zealand or from the Eastern States, um, the, just, the cost of shipping is huge because of the amount of space that insulation takes up in a truck or a container. So a typical family home might need in excess of a 20 foot container full of insulation. So it starts to get very expensive to actually, you know, bring this material from elsewhere. But if you're living in an area where wool insulation is available and abundant and cost effective, it's def definitely worth looking at. Um, hemp, is, hemp and hempcrete are fairly new materials on the scene. Um, there's a number of people doing hemp creed in Western Australia. It's got fantastic um, specific heat capacity va values. Um, unfortunately, I have yet to find anybody who's doing hemp creed bat, which would fit within our stud frame system. And the reason why I'm interested in the bat is because I want to be able to deliver modern homes that aren't too challenging, that um, people find are quite familiar, and that means standard sort of plasterboard, you know, roofs, uh, plasterboard ceilings and walls. Um, hempcrete has a particular sort of look to it. Um, it's not for everybody, but um, it does have fantastic properties if that's what you're looking for. And it's probably best suited to um, maybe a more rural type setting, um, but a fantastic product. And I'm hoping that one day um, some manufacturers get in the business of producing hempcrete or hemp bats. Uh, straw bale is something that pops up every now and again. Once again, uh, once again, it's something that's probably best suited to a, a more rural setting. Um, pretty good properties from straw. It's obviously natural. Um, it has low thermal conductivity um, and a fairly good specific heat capacity. The reason I put variable there is because it really depends on the, um, I guess, you know, the density of the straw bale in the particular setting, the particular application as to its. Um, values and you probably as a you know owner builder or a builder you're probably not going to get it tested um, for the for the one-off product but bearing in mind that um, if you're looking for something that's sustainable you've got the wall thickness to um, allow that and you're open to the sorts of um, the look of building that you get from a straw bale then this can be a good option it's certainly not something that we're looking at in terms of our more I guess suburban homes uh, cellulose was something that we looked at very seriously. Um, you might know it as uh, um, some brand names. We had a brand name in Perth called Cool or Cozy, and it's typically blown in. It's a blown in product made of recycled um, newspaper. They add um, sort of not uh, you know, anti vermin, anti inflammatory sort of product additives to it, nothing noxious. Um, and it was used for quite a long time in Western Australia. People were blowing it into their brick cavities and blowing it into their ceilings. And it turned out to be a bit of a nightmare um, when the homes were, um, you know, being demolished. It just goes everywhere. 
Um, and the other thing is, is that it is prone to slumping in a wall cavity. So I thought this may have been the magic ingredient for our, our homes for a while there, um, given its sort of environmental, um, you know, credentials. Um, the fact that it's very cost effective, it's made from a very low cost, you know, material. It has a very high specific heat capacity. So we actually built a wall frame um, with a vapor, vapor permeable membrane externally and an airtight membrane internally. And we tried blowing the cellulose in and it just completely uh, failed because when you blow a product into an enclosed space, the air needs to get out. And in an airtight home, our uh, framing system is airtight. So it just um, blows up like a balloon. It's, it's a massive fail for an airtight building. That said, it may work um, in some buildings um, where it's not airtight, um, but it's definitely worth looking at if it's available. Now, wood fiber is something that I would probably consider to be the gold standard. And this is something we're looking at very seriously. And we actually have um, one house in construction at the moment um, using wood fiber. Um, and I've got a number of homes in design people for people that are very interested in using this product. Um, the reason why it's of great interest is because it sort of has this magic uh, property of being both uh, having very high thermal resistance or low thermal conductivity, but also has a high specific heat capacity. And it means that it, it really does provide good phase shift in terms of um, you know, minimizing heat gain um, through the material. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's nobody manufacturing this product in Australia, which is you know, amazing considering our timber industry. So it does have to come from Europe. Um, and that means long lead times. And it's also very expensive. Um, however, we've figured that we can make it work because we don't need as thick a wall system structurally to achieve the same level of performance. So here's an example of a wall system with a 90 millimeter stud, 80 millimeter bulk insulation of mineral uh, of wood fiber and externally uh, using a 60 mil wood fiber bat. And that bat will be lime rend, uh, not the bat, sorry, the panel externally on the outside face will be lime rendered, which is a vapor permeable um, you know, uh, treatment. And with that system, an overall thickness um, of insulation of uh, 140 millimetres, we are achieving an 8.2 hour phase shift. And now that's exceptionally good. And the major benefit of this in a hot climate is that 60 millimetre uh, wood fibre panel externally is like a blanket around the house and really buffers the structural framing. And if it's continuous, it provides a, a fantastic thermal envelope for the home. Um, so this is something we're very interested in doing. We're trying to get around the, the supply issues for it, the long lead times and how that factors in in terms of how clients pay for it well ahead of when it's due to land and all that sort of stuff. But it's very exciting. And um, ideally, I'd love to see an Australian industry come out of um, wood fibre, uh, bulk insulation and, and panels. Um, so here's a little, ex little example um, of the comparison between uh, a wall system for wood fibre and a wall system for glass wall. Um, you can see the, the difference, 8.2 hours versus 5.7. And the glass, you have to bear in mind that with a, uh, a wall system that's stud framed with glass wall, you still need to provide a cavity externally and then you're providing cladding as well. So you have all of those costs. Whereas what we found with the wood fibre um, because the external layer is insulation and that we're then rendering it, we're doing away with additional layers of battens, vapor permeable membranes, air gaps, and, um, and uh, cladding. So we're finding there's actually, you know, it's getting closer and closer in cost. And actually, you know, external claddings are going up in price with this current housing boom. Um, color bonds going up in price, um, you know, all the fiber cement products, timber. So it's actually making the cost of these building systems a lot more comparable. Um, yeah, so I think that's where we're definitely going to be heading in the long run. So uh, in summary, um, when you're considering your insulation, consider the thickness, um, consider the density of the uh, insulation, and consider the specific heat capacity. 
Um, vapor permeability is something that hasn't been touched on in this presentation, but it's very important to consider if you're looking at products like extruded polystyrene, bear in mind that they have very low vapor permeability. You always need to provide a path for vapor to escape from your structure. You can't enclose both sides of a structure. Um, in terms of sustainability, I think it's important to consider end of life and also manufacturing. It's not enough to have a low, um, an energy efficient home if that home is made out of uh, products with high embodied energy and a, you know bad in terms of end of life disposal. Lead times is a big factor. And I guess there's a risk element there in terms of ordering products from overseas. Um, you need to consider the installation method, um, make sure your builders are on board with um, and comfortable with both procuring and installing uh, the product that you're selecting. And last but not least, cost. So there's huge variability in the cost of different insulation products. Um, clever design can help to offset or I guess shift some of those costs around to make things more affordable as I've tried to explain with the wood fiber. Um, but there certainly comes a point in a lot of homes where you're spending more and more and more money to achieve an ideal, say, um, level of performance. It may well be that you get to a point where it, there's diminishing returns and you may actually be better off um, taking some of that money and spending it on, say, solar panels and uh, split system air conditioning to do the rest of the job. And that's kind of the balance we're looking to achieve is going, well, we're going to take the building envelope um, to a certain uh, place where it represents a good balance between value and performance. And then for the last amount of uh, comfort, we're going to be achieving that with a balance between um, you know, air conditioning and uh, solar panels to offset the cost of running that air conditioning. So that's it, thanks very much. Fantastic, thanks so much, Ben. That was really interesting and another host of questions. Um, so we are heading to the Q&A section now. Uh, we've got a lot of questions, we've got like over 50 questions. We'll do our best to get through as many as we can. Uh, before we start on the questions, I just want to introduce our three other guest panelists. And these are people who've got homes, their homes in the on the sustainable, sustainable House Day website. Uh, so I'm going to introduce each one and they'll give a quick sort of 20 second introduction about them and their house. So first up, we've got Romney Bishop, who's got a house called Our Comfy Home in Victoria. It's comfy now, but it wasn't. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, good. Okay. Sorry. I'm getting different messages up on the screen. <laughs> um, it wasn't when we first moved in. It was, um, it's made out of concrete block and uh, with a flat roof and a concrete slab, um, massive floor to ceiling windows in pretty much every room. So it was uh, stinking hot in summer and freezing cold in winter. Uh, so we, over a few years, we did um, quite a lot of renovating where we um, actually replaced the roof, left the ceiling in place, but replaced the roof and um, built up the rafters uh, so we could fit insulation in there, uh, insulated all the external walls and replaced the inefficient um, heating and hot water appliances. Um, and now it is very comfortable. We've got a, an annual electricity bill of $360. Wow, that's fantastic. That's really incredible. It's amazing what you can do, even what, through what sounded like a pretty challenging one. Next up, we've got Matthew Kosnick, who's got the Thornley Passive House in New South Wales. Thanks, Dean. Um, I'm Matthew Kosnick, um, owner of Thornley Passive House. And um, we're Sydney's first, or we're Sydney's first certified passive house. Now there are several others, which is a good step. We're moving in the right direction towards well-built houses. Um, I guess I would make two quick comments. One is that the building envelope is one of those things that ideally you should do once and is something that is something that pays back for the entire life of the house. So it's certainly something to worth think about. Um, the other thing I would say is there's as designed and there's as built. 
And certainly one of the reasons why we went down the road to doing a certified passive house is because it actually involves people coming in and testing and saying, yes, what was actually built was what you actually asked to have built. Um, and I think there's lots of, of issues like that. So it's a good thing to test as verify, trust but verify, I think is famous saying. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, totally. Thanks. Um, our third uh, panelist um, is Lucinda Flynn. Uh, who's got home patch in Victoria? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm I'm a um, trained and accredited home energy efficiency assessor, and our house, I suppose, has been a, a practice ground for all of the things that I've learned over the years. We live in a '70s house, and it was certainly a bit like Romney's when we got here. It had every single draft you could imagine, and pretty much no insulation and all that sort of stuff and electric hot water system. So we've just over the years upgraded different sections of it with a real focus on low cost and DIY options. Um, and that's my biggest interest really is um, talking to people about what they can do with their existing older homes to make them more comfortable and energy efficient without you know, necessarily having to take the step of knocking it down and starting again. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, actually a lot of our questions are around retro fitting. So I might start on a couple of the retro fitting questions. Uh, there's an interesting one here from Jess. Uh, when buying an older home, especially one that might've been built prior to insulation being standard, what are some things to look out for to ensure that you're buying something that's actually got potential to make better? So I'll throw that to the panel. Someone jump in and take it from there. Um, I might jump in uh, for a bit. First, yep. at that time, um, before we built our current house in the southern Gold Coast, we had a 1970s house in Brisbane that had no wall insulation, brick veneer, etc. You can actually insulate older homes um, fairly cheaply by removing your internal gyp rock walls and adding your insulation and then resheating your internal walls. And in particular, western, western and eastern walls in, in our climate um, in particular. Yeah. Uh, could I add a couple of things? I'm not sure. The person that asked the question, I'm not sure where you're located. But if, if you are located in a colder area like Melbourne, um, it's quite possible here to pump in wall insulation. Um, yeah, you are in Melbourne. So uh, I don't think it's available in all areas of Australia, but here um, you can pump it in from the external walls, whether they're brick veneer or double brick or... Uh, weatherboard and it's um, not not that hard we've had it done to our house um, so any any wall would be okay in that in that uh, way if you're looking for a house that's easy to insulate the ceiling I would just say that flat roofs as Rom as Romney found it's much much harder if you've got an attic style roof then there's plenty of space you can get up there or the installers can get up there and put it in but once you have a flat roof you've got it figure out a way to get it in, which can be by pumping it in if there's space, but there's not always space. So. Yeah, really good point about the flat roof. And there was a question here, I actually can't find out, but there was a question here about, you know, what, what are the options for retrofitting into a flat roof? So is there any other suggestions on flat roofs? Um, I, I could say we've got an extension room in our 70s house that had a flat roof and it just literally had um, plaster, ceiling plaster, and then a gap, and then a metal roof. It was terrible. And in the end, the insulators couldn't take up the metal from outside, which they would ideally do, and pump it in. So instead, they drilled some little holes, 20 cent hole, uh, 20 cent piece size hole, and um, blew the insulation into the roof, just like they did from the external walls. Yeah, right. Okay. Worked any, really well. Any other comments from uh, Ben or Wendy? Yeah, I guess it, it, oh, um, I think the main thing is there really to, um, if you can remove a layer of the envelope, whether it's in internal or external, and you can access um, that zone, then you can put insulation in. But my main concern is really about, um, you know, where the, uh, the passage of uh, condensation um, and water and all that sort of thing. So sometimes some of these old houses weren't insulated, but because there was good airflow in those spaces, any sort of leaks or anything like that were able to, to dry out or you're able to identify them quite easy. As soon as you start pumping insulation into, say, a cavity brick wall or a, um, 
um, say a cottage stud frame structure, you start bridging the, the spaces, you start bridging the space between the internal layer and the external layer, any sort of moistness or wetness that is, you're providing a path for it to travel through. And if it can't then dry out on its own, you're creating an environment for mould, um, a rising damp, these sorts of things. So I don't think it's, it's not gonna be as simple as just pumping a, uh, vent, uh, insulation into a void. You need to really consider how it works as part of the whole system. Yeah, really good point. Yeah, I'd agree with that too. Um, we actually had to rem remove the tin from our roof because it had several skylights in it that we um, got rid of uh, and we couldn't find the same tin profile. So we had to just completely start from scratch. Um, but what we've done is put um, air cell uh, under the tin as a, as a vapour Barrier. Or condensation barrier and then underneath that we have um, this uh, PIR board rigid board and um, where we could in the middle of the house where there's a bigger gap we put polyester bats on top of that as well so we ended up fitting about R6 in the middle of the house yeah right okay um, sort of also on the on spray insulation, uh, Robert asks, uh, is spray foam good for an insulation retrofit, especially for hard to reach areas such as a subfloor? And can it be removed at the end of life if you want to, um, say, recycle the floorboards? I might uh, talk about that. <laughs> I actually raised that at, at a discussion we had with the Building Codes Board and um, some of the building industry earlier this week when I said about our problems with subfloor and someone said, oh, well, they just spray spray it underneath. My concerns about that, uh, um, can, the, can you reuse, you know, when the house needs to be at the end of its life, can you reuse your boards? How can you scrape it off, um, et cetera? And then what are the implications for all the services that are underneath the house? Um, so for, our, for my house, I can't see how spray insulation would work subfloor. But spray insulation is used a lot in the US and, and in, in, yeah, in the US in particular for subfloors, walls, et cetera. Yeah, and look, I might touch on another subfloor question that we've got here from um, Mina in Queensland, who has got an old raised Queenslander, mostly open underneath, that's got gaps between the floorboards thinking of issues with spills and dust, et cetera, what are the best subfloor insulation options for that? Um, I, my view on that would, depending on how much space you have, so if it's a typical Queenslander that might be, you know, a metre and a half or two metres off the ground or something, either putting a rigid board like the PIR um, or, yeah, I'd, I'd probably say a rigid board and then a, um, a foil or, or a, a wire uh, mesh to hold it to hold it up. If you're using any bulk insulation, it's important that you understand that there's different insulation stiffness depending on whether the insulation is meant for a roof, a wall, or a sub. So if you're doing bulk insulation under the floor, you have to get something that's specifically for under floor because it has a different stiffness to a wall insulation or a, a ceiling insulation. Uh. I would add to that. Um, I would add to that that uh, you know if you're bulking up the insulation in your subfloor, your home is only going to perform as well as its sort of weakest link. So you can't just you know if you're investing a lot of money and, and trouble doing that in your subfloor, but you're not necessarily doing anything about the roof or the walls, um, you're probably wasting your money. So there's no point having R6 in your subfloor and you know virtually nothing in your walls. You want to try and keep you know as Wendy pointed out in her presentation you want to have a continu continuous layer of insulation and if it was my home I prefer to see a lower R value but continuous around the whole building rather than just attacking one surface. Yeah that's a really good point about looking at the whole the whole house and in fact we've got a question um, here from Liesl that's a, a bit sort of related to that so I might throw it in here um, if you're, you know, say working on a 70s brick veneer, removing plasterboard, re-roofing, 
you know, you 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 want to improve air leakage, or not improve, but you like prevent, reduce air leakage, new insulation. Uh, what it, what is the best approach to look at all those aspects together? Um, so when we retrofitted our 70s house in Brisbane um, and we did things um, much like, uh, I think it was Lucinda who said, you know, bit at a time as money became available, do DYI. So we had a, an old tile roof that needed repointing and, you know, some repairs anyway. So we took that opportunity to change the colour from dark green to a cream for a start. Um, we put insulation on the ceiling. We... Um, stapled foil underneath the rafters. Um, so we just, in Brisbane, you start from the top and you work your way down. If you can do nothing else, doing the roof and the ceiling is really important. Yep, makes a lot of was, sense. Was the person that asked that query in, in Queensland? Do you know? Uh, does not say oh, no. question. I, well, I could add, um, when I do energy assessments, the, rule, the general um, priority list is always first is draft proofing, and it's usually the cheapest and simplest thing to do as well. The second would always be roof insulation, and uh, third would usually be window improvements of some kind, um, and then depending on the house, wall or underfloor insulation. And I, I think I, I think Ben and Wendy have both pointed out each house is different and. For example, our house is on a, the side of a hill on stilts. So I, I don't think that we probably have those condensation issues so much. And for us, it was much more important to put underfloor insulation on because there's so much airflow under our house. Whereas a house that is, um, you know, just on, on the ground with a solid um, subfloor walls, it's not as, and say they have carpet everywhere, it's nowhere near as important. Yeah, for sure. So you got to take each house and figure out for that house what what matters yeah. most. Yeah, for sure. And in fact, that this is a great segue. <laughs> We've got a, a couple of questions on uh, subfloor insulation in different climates. Uh, Wendy has asked, "Is subfloor insulation recommended for hotter climates?" And um, uh, where is it? Kay asks, "I'm in Mount Dandenong in Victoria." five degrees colder than Melbourne, does underfloor insulation make a big difference given that heat rises? Um, yes, it does. I, I would say that probably in, in Cairns or, or Darwin, you probably don't need to have your subfloor insulation. Um, it really depends on what your climate is and whether you need to address winter coldness as well as summer hotness. So in Brisbane, because we get both, you know, we, get it, we have a short winter, but nevertheless, it still is a winter. It's worthwhile doing. Um, yeah. whether you get, you know, past Townsville or something, I would say probably not. Um, I should point out that um, the 2022 National Construction Code is likely to change and will require sub, will require uh, sub slab insulation in cold climates, um, most likely. So, you know, even your slab on ground being on waffle pods, for example, and um, insulating the the sides of your um, slab, cement slab, as well as subfloor insulation. Yeah, okay, I might go to one more uh, subfloor question before I move on to some other insulation questions. Um, Gabrielle in the Blue Mountains, uh, her house is on brick piers and she oh. asked what are the pros and cons of bats versus say spraying insulation or other types of insulation for subfloor? We've tried, um, we've tried Bats and um, Protherm, sort of like the uh, foil type stuff um, and rigid foam. And we have problems with rodents with all of those. Um, if we provide a nice, a nice space with an air gap, the rats really like it for breeding in winter. Um, so we haven't come up with a solution in a semi-rural area that's um, rodent proof, where you can still get to the services that still provides um, stopping the air leaks and stopping the air movement and resisting the heat. So um, I'm still open. I'm still exploring good options that meet all of those. Yeah, okay. Are there any other thoughts from other members of the panel on that one before we move on? I've heard that rats don't like polyester very much. Polyester bats. 
Yeah. Uh, yes, but we have uh, we have polyester vat, but the, the, the rats will get between the polyester bats and the floor because the, the polyester bats make a nice soft bedding. <laughs> Uh, well, that's what we've got. So <laughs> maybe maybe that explains a few things. <laughs> I might move on for a couple of the more general insulation questions. And one that's come up a few times from a few people is how long does insulation last for? Do you need to replace it after a certain time? And how is it different for different types of insulation? I think um, the answer probably applies to all building products. Um, it's very rare to find products with a long warranty. Um, so you can assume that your product may do better than the warranty, but who knows beyond that? I um, mean, certain, certain products will degrade over time. For example, um, um, vapor permeable membranes and airtight membranes are very important in a passive house. They talk about a sort of 50 year lifespan, but these products haven't even existed for 50 years. So how would you even know? Um, so you blow in cellulose, for example, you know, anecdotally, we know that it slumps, it's, it's going to happen. So you probably want to allow for that in the installation so that perhaps you can come back and check on it and after a season and top it up or even again, you know, years down the track. Um, I think the only way to really understand whether or not the, the products are continuing to perform is to monitor the performance of the home and understand, you know, uh, obviously climate's changing summer's getting hotter and um but at the same time you know if if you're looking if you're monitoring performance if you're using a thermal imaging camera and you're um having a look at your walls to see if something's changing over time that's probably the best way of seeing if things are changing wendy i'd probably add to that that um theoretically there's no reason why most of your bulk discussion shouldn't last for the life of your building 40, 50, 60 years. So your, your wool, your polyester, your glass wool, et cetera. Um, but it's important they don't get wet. Um, and it's important there's nothing else that what, rather than the life of the insulation, what typically stops the insulation working well is when tradies come in and put in, you know, more plumbing, piping, whatever, and they punch holes in the insulation or they remove it and don't put it back or your hot water system on your roof leaks and, and your, your ceiling bats get wet um, and all that sort of thing. So it's more maintenance and workmanship issues that, that tend to deteriorate a lot of the insulation. But Ben, right, and no one's looking at the, the life, no one's managed to, measured the life cycle of a lot of these insulation things. That's a really good point about what your last point there. Um, I actually had the experience of having a one of the Victorian energy efficiency scorecard assessments on my place. And the assessor found a whole lot of my insulation had been removed and then piled up in one corner when someone had like replaced some wires and never put it back. So it's recommended to stick your head up there if you've ever had work done just to check it out. Um, mm. And that sort of segues nicely to a um, question from Tony. And, and I think this is also was shown in Wendy's presentation at the beginning um you know you, you showed us compressed you talked about compressed bats and you showed us um you know inappropriately installed insulation how can you verify the quality of the insulation is there a good way to work with a builder to ensure that the insulation is installed properly and it's the appropriate type of insulation and it's installed well um, what I recommend to people that I work with with our research is that you write it into your building contract that you want to see the thermal imaging, uh, the thermal images of the installed on the installed product. You want to see the receipt of, of the product that was supplied and you want to see pictures. So un, under the construction code, the, they're meant to supply evidence that materials have been installed properly. So I would requ require that evidence as a homeowner, photos, thermal imaging, and the bill of supply. Yeah, good, good points. Any other comments on that from maybe from Matthew or from Ben or someone else? I, mean, I, I definitely agree that there's, there's a lot to be said for verifying what was done. Um, and the other thing I would, would put out there, it's incredibly cheap to put some temperature monitoring capabilities into your house that will just throw data onto the internet. So long as you have an internet connection, you never have to think about it. 
and it will just log, you know, I have sensors that will log CO2 and humidity and temperature every five minutes, throw it up onto the web. I don't have to think about it for years, but I can go back and grab that information. And it will tell you about the trends and what's going on in your house and how often you're overheating. Are you getting a good enough supply of air and all those sorts of things? Yeah, that's really good advice. Just keep an eye on that. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna, I might add something there on the verification that um, in Townsville, so you can get now fairly cheap thermal cameras called FLIR One that attach to your iPhone. We bought a set of those. We gave them to the local Bunnings store in Townsville who had them in their trade people could borrow for the weekend. Um, so, you know, getting more cameras and, and Bunnings stores, et cetera, to have tools that people can borrow to be able to go out and, you know, take a picture of where are the energy leaks in their house, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, look, the main thing I think and is working with pe people who are like-minded and passionate. I mean, I fully endorse what Wendy said about trusting, but also verifying. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, the people building or doing the work, they need to be coming from a place where it's important to them personally that they, they get it right they're not that they're not just ticking a box or doing it because you said they have to do it if they have a personal care uh, factor then that's more important than anything and that applies to everything draft ceiling um, workmanship um, you know making sure the correct insulation is supplied everything from top to bottom you may miss something but if you have a team working with you or working on your on your home that genuinely cares and has a history of caring then that's the that's a very important step yeah yeah for sure sort of staying on the theme of insulation being unevenly installed uh bobby asked a question uh they used a builder who ran his thermal imaging camera over a building he didn't found the coldest part was the corners where there was triple studs and not enough room to install insulation Jess also is interested in this question. Jess has seen a method used in two studs in the US, but hasn't found much detail about it in Australia. And or if the builders understand a lot about these types of framing techniques. Yeah, well, um, you know, coming from a timber framed environment, um, it it pays to have builders who are also carpenters who care to do the research and to figure it out. So um, you know, all my builders are carpenters, um, they they're doing the California corner. Um, and that they're thinking ahead. It's not accidental, those junctions. They're actually thinking ahead and planning out their framing so that they can either get insulation in there or they can affect, account for the fact that they'll never get insulation in there. Um, and, you know, you can draw the detail, you can um, specify it, but if the person at the other end doesn't care, then it's going to fall apart. So, yeah. Yeah, really good. That's that's really useful. Thanks. Um, can you install, this is from Naomi, can you install insulation bats directly against a roof blanket or do you need a membrane to deal with condensation? And I guess expand some, any other sort of recommendations about dealing with condensation in, in, when insulating? Um, yeah, well, I guess from a building science point of view, condensation is going to occur when you have, say, warm air meeting a cold surface. Um, so um, you want to try and um, minimise that effect. Um, generally speaking, you know, mineral wool bats, they absorb water. You know, they're not particularly good. Um, if you're relying on your roof, you know, for example, Calibon roof to, to provide the water tightness, I think that's probably um, placing unfounded trust in that layer. Um, and I would definitely want to see that you've got, you know, taped and watertight membranes underneath that layer, then you can safely provide your insulation. Um, unfortunately, the building code doesn't really go into that level of detail. You're really relying on your designer, your, um, your builder to know, A, know about building science and B, care enough about it to do something about it. So yeah, you, you really do need to be very conscious of the fact that um, you don't want to create opportunities for condensation to occur and, and then resulting mold and um, wetness in your structure. Yeah. Are there any other comments on that from any of the other panelists? 
There is a um, correct way to install your bulk insulation and um, in relation to the vapour barrier, and that is to leave a um, minimum 40 millimetre air gap between the two. Okay. And air itself is part of the insulation that adds that adds to the insulating value of, yeah, so air, air gap's good. Yeah. And an air gap's great also because it can dry out any yeah. incidental yeah. condensation or water ingress. And it's a good example of what Ben and Wendy both talked about in your presentation is that getting insulation is not just one thing, it's the way all the parts of the wall or ceiling or yeah. whatever work together, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to throw a couple more insulation questions before we move on to another topic. Um, while we're talking about where you insulate, should eaves also be insulated? Um, I, you know, it's it's part of the whole system of the building. Um, corners of a building are fantastic thermal bridges because you've got the intersection, uh, or you've got a greater surface area at corners for a given internal surface area. So you're going to have the greatest amount of heat loss or heat gain in, in corners and junctions. So if you have a roof that sails past, say, a, a top external wall, um, and if that's insulated, that can actually provide something of a thermal buffer to that thermal bridge. So for the sake of uh, doing the job right, when, you, when you're actually there, I think it's just a case it just makes sense to continue the insulation, continue your thermal membranes, um, and continue your water tightness all the way out to the edge of the eaves and then back to the wall again. Um, there's really, there's, there's not a lot of savings to be had by, you know, um, you know, selling yourself short in that area. Yeah. I might add something to that, that in our 70s house in Brisbane, uh, mm -hmm. with hip, a hip roof, the actual, uh, the eave was lower than the ceiling level, which meant that part of your external wall was actually ah. up into the ceiling space itself. So it was, and the walls weren't insulated and the ceiling wasn't insulated. So it also depends a bit on the, the structure type of your roof and your walls and where your eaves sit in respect to your walls. But yeah, I agree with Ben, you insulate as much as you possibly can everywhere. Nice segue to the next insulation question. Can you ever over insulate a wall or a ceiling? It's from Peter. You really need to understand your climate because if you if you build an esky in Darwin, um, it will be quite good a lot of the time. But if you get an extended period of hot weather, gradually that internal temperature will get higher and higher. And a really well insulated building, if it doesn't have somewhere for that heat to escape, will get too hot. So it's not so much that you've over insulated, it's that you haven't thought about all of the other things that need to be part of the whole picture. You need somewhere for hot air to escape when inside gets too hot. Yeah, oh, right. go on. Oh, sorry. I would also just sort of go back to the comment from my presentation, the sort of the law of diminishing returns, you know, from economics, is you start pumping more and more money into, say, the envelope. And you're really only affecting the margins of performance in hot or cold conditions. And you may actually get a lot better value by looking at alternative systems that actually provide a greater degree of comfort um, and value to you personally throughout the year. Um, so you just want to sort of want to go, well, you know, is it worth my while doubling the cost of insulation? Or do I take that, say, $10 a square metre that may add up to, say, $10,000 and then go, well, I'm going to myself um, buy myself a pv system and uh, a small uh, split system air conditioner yep so it's, it's a systems thinking that that really needs to be applied what are you trying to achieve where are you achieving it and how does everything work together yeah look we also have a question from laurie who asks does insulation add to the thermal wrap the thermal mass or, or retain heat at night thinking of the tropics darwin etc where having a cool house at night is important. So I feel like we've covered some of that. Is there anything more that you want to add that will help answer that question? Um, so uh, it kind of goes back to that specific heat capacity, um, yeah. you know, 
presentation that some some products do actually have a capacity to um, retain the coolness or or the heat. Now you don't want you're not looking to create a lot of thermal mass like a brick home, um, but you do want to slow down the passage of heat through the structure. Um, so it's about finding that balance, I think. Yeah. For, for our house in southeast Queensland, that's why we put our thermal mass inside the house and we have a lightweight structure on the outside of the house. Um, some thermal mass inside in Darwin would work well, um, but in Darwin, you're, it's much more important to stop to, for shading, to stop the heat from getting onto your external walls. So at least a, a metre or metre and a half wide eaves, shading, et cetera. As the first step. Yeah, cool. In, in, in relation to that, I would throw in, it's important to think about what you're insulating for, right? So there's a lot of things in your house that generate heat, including yourself, right? Bodies generate heat. All your appliances generate heat. So in areas where you're insulating to keep your house cool, there's an extra effort you've got to make to get that heat out somehow, because otherwise it will just build up. Um, if you're living in a cold climate, then that's not really an issue and you can save all that heat and take it all the way to the bank, so to speak. So it is important to think about how you are trying to run your house and realize that, you know, effectively a shade tree could make a huge difference if it's a, and that's not insulation per se, but it's preventing that heat from hitting your envelope in the first place. And then you don't have to insulate against it. Yeah. Look, we've, we've got heaps of other interesting questions about insulation, but I might move on to another topic because I want to try and cover everything at least a bit. Uh, there was some stuff on solar reflectance of roofs and we got a few questions about that. Um, I'll start with the one from CJ who asks, is there a difference in solar reflectance for a gloss finish versus a matte finish? Um, it's a combination of finish and the material itself. So whether it's steel, whether it's, it's um, uh, cement tile, whether it's, it's tin and whether it's gloss or matte. Right. So I think on, um, if, for colour bond roofs, for example, you can find on colour bond's website what the solar reflectance is for all of their colours on their products. And they have a couple of products that are specifically with a really high solar reflectance in, uh, index. And the others are, so generally your, your creams, pale eucalypt sort of thing have a reflectance of about, you know, 70, 60 to 70%. Your medium colours are around the 40, 50. If you have a, a black roof, you know, it's, it, it's absorbing most of the solar radiation. So what I find interesting is when I fly into Melbourne, I see a lot of red roofs and black roofs. When you fly into Townsville, you will see predominantly white roofs. Yeah, so roofs that have a bit less reflectance sort of do suit colder climates a bit more where you're dealing with keeping warm a lot more than keeping cool. That makes sense. Is, is colour the most significant factor in reflectance? I mean, you've talked about the material and, the, and that, but is colour... So light colours certainly reflect more than dark colours, but, you can, but it's also the chemistry of what the, what the coating is. So okay. what they call reflective paints now have a particular chemistry that, that will have particular um, chemicals or ingredients in them that reflect more of the solar radiation. So a solar reflectant paint that's white will reflect more than a standard white paint, for example. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Um, another one about roof reflectance and roof temperature. What happens if you have, um, say, a, a reflective roof, but you've got a large area of it covered with solar panels, especially dark colored solar panels? And, and, and I guess more generally, how do solar panels on a roof, especially dark ones, affect both reflectance and the performance of the insulation? Yeah, so for a start, most of the solar panels in Australia, um, they absorb the solar radiation from the top that's what they're designed to do in order to generate the electricity. And those solar panels, in essence, are shading your roof. So I wouldn't waste, I wouldn't waste money on putting solar reflectant paint where I'm going to put a solar panel, for example, necessarily, although it might help keep the roof a little bit cooler, which will help the PVs generate more. 
Um, there is some newer types of solar panels that can actually uh, capture solar radiation from both the backside and the front side. Okay. Interesting to see whether a solar reflectant roof coating would actually help boost their output. Um, but I haven't seen any published research on that yet. Yeah, interesting. I'm wondering if any of our uh, homeowner panelists have some experience or thoughts on what you like, what you did with your roofs in your places, and how much you consider this. When we replaced our roof, we went with a very light colour, uh, June colour bond, I think it is, um, and that is because we are the, our climate is warming, and um, we wanted to future proof the house to some extent. Our solar panels are on our carport because our roof is shaded in winter, so they make no difference to us. Yeah. So June is one of the one of the, the lighter colour bond colours and has a reflectance of about 70%. So it's a it's a good it's a good mix to mix to have. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um a question from Kim. Um, in southwestern Victoria, in southwestern Victoria, where cool winters, hot summers, how significant is roof colour to thermal efficiency if you have a thermal insulation blanket under the tin? Um, from my perspective, it's still always because the in, the effectiveness of the insulation is still impacted by the temperature difference between the inside and outside. So if you can reduce the temperature of the roof material itself by having a light colour, it's worthwhile. So I wouldn't bother changing a colour now if the roof didn't need um, any maintenance, but if you need to maintain the roof, um, that's a good time to change the colour. Yeah. Because it, it is essentially doesn't cost any, any different to have a different colour. It costs a little bit more to have a solar reflectance material itself, but at roof maintenance time, it's a really good time to make that change. I have um, heard from people who've changed, who've actually painted their roof either just with a white paint or a reflective paint that it makes an enormous difference in summer to the indoor temperature. Mm. And another one on the temperature inside the roofs. What about the effect of, this, is, this question is from Robert, what about the effect of fans to ventilate within the ceiling cavity, particularly you say fans that start automatically when a certain temperature is reached. Yeah, so certainly in Queensland, um, I see a, you know these little whirly bird things on the roof because you can go into Bunnings and you can buy a whirly bird for a hundred bucks or something. But I often see just one of these on a roof and but you have to read the instructions that one whirly bird might actually um, be able to vent about 20 square, me 20 square meters. And a, and a typical roof house is going to be uh, a lot bigger than that. So one whirly bird is not going to make much difference to a standard house. Um, you need to size the, the roof vents to the area and the volume of the roof that you want to vent. And then you need to consider other things such as condensation and air movement and dust and a whole range of things. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that mechanical, uh, as in electrical ones or solar powered ones, are much a much better option uh, because they have a lot more power to extract air. And the other thing is that if you're trying to extract air, you need to allow there to be air coming in to replace the air that's going out. Because otherwise, if you're extracting air, you'll be potentially, if you're in an older house, pulling outside air through the drafts in the into the house, which is warm air. So. Yeah. yeah. So in Queen, in Queensland, where the temperature difference is is not that much, you know, you you need um, vents in your eaves, or or you know, where where is the air going to come from if you're pumping air out? Yeah, as as um, Lucinda says. Yeah. Um, I might move on to a couple of other topics. Um, Leslie says we haven't spoken much about blinds, though. Wendy, you did mention shading. What should we look out for, especially external blinds and I guess other approaches to shading? And yeah, you might have a few more thoughts on that, Wendy. And 
I'd be interested to hear from some of the homeowner panelists about the, what they did with shading as well. Yeah, so, so for shading, it's um, my mantra of start from the outside in. I mean, I'm a big believer in curtains um, and we, we've put thermal curtains on all of our windows on the inside, but start from the outside. So outside shading um, in, in our area, having vertical shading on the east and west and horizontal shading on the north and south. Whereas um, we're looking at a building at the moment that was built just north of Brisbane and the architect has put 300 millimetre horizontal eaves on all orientations of the building on all windows, but it, it makes, it provides no shading at all for east and west windows. And 300 is not nearly enough for north and south for our latitude either. Uh, east and west must be vertical shading on the outside and internal curtains to, um, to add an extra layer of, of, of air gap between the window and, and the room. Can I um, add as well that depending on what your budget is, really external shading can be pretty much anything. It's a physical barrier. So if you've got no money, just um, string up some shade cloth or something, some, something cheap, a shade sale. If you've got a bigger budget, you can get all sorts of amazing retractable electronic blinds and stuff. Yeah. But my absolute favourite is deciduous vines that give you nice thick green foliage all summer and shade you. And then in the winter, they lose all their leaves and you get your beautiful sunlight in. But it can be anything. So don't, don't feel like it has to be one particular kind of shading. I'm a, I'm a big ad, advocate for probably the most ugly blight on suburbia and that's the roller blind. <laughs> um, you know, if, if they can be, they're quite cost effective. It's a very uh, competitive market supply and install of roller blinds, but they, they are they do actually provide a fantastic job of providing both shading on shading to your glass, um, block out um, at night for sleeping, and then of course they're insulated um, anyway, so they um, you know they prevent the heat sort of radiating through the shade, the shaded product onto the glass. So um, particularly east and west windows, when you have the low angle sun, if you can have something that does it all, um, you may not even need curtains internally because you're getting this multiple benefit of block out, um, shading, uh, noise, all these different things. And it's much better to think about this at the time when you're building and install it at that phase where you might actually be able to hide the, say the pelmet for those ugly roller shutters. So it can almost be an invisible installation. And then internally, you might find yourself actually saving money and not needing block out curtains and you know roller roller blinds or um, plantation shutters or whatever people choose to do these days. So I'm a huge advocate of that. Probably not on an elevation that's facing the street, but um, but certainly uh, east and west uh, away from the street if possible. Uh, I want to add a tip that someone told me as well that try and install the external shading that you are most likely to use. Because if you install something that's, well, the example she always gives is, if you can afford it, get remote controlled shading that you can pull up and down because you're more likely to use it actively at the beginning of a hot day. Whereas if it's, say if it's really hard to crank them open, you're more likely to go, oh, yeah, stuff it, I can't be bothered doing that today. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah. A, a, and a shade sale is an example. It, once it's up, it's up, but you you need to then take it down when it's no longer needed. So you still have to be active with how you how you use the shading. Yeah, look, we're um, pretty much getting close to running out of time and we've managed to make it through about half the questions. So apologies to people who we haven't managed to answer their questions. I've tried to do a bit of a selection of questions to go across the breadth, but we do have time for one more or possibly two if the first one is a short-ish answer. So it's an issue we haven't really talked about yet. Uh, and it's come from Lydia. What is the end of life for these different insulation products? What do I do with when the house is demolished? Uh, does it end up in landfill, etc.? And sort of related, uh, there's another question also about, well, what about like the, the embodied energy of some of these materials as well? So 
I'm not sure. Do we? I don't know, maybe we want to start with Ben for that one, and then see if someone else has got some. Yeah, I, I guess I kind of covered that in the presentation that I would always look for products that a have low embodied energy in their manufacture, and b have a responsible sort of end of life. Um, you know, materials like the wood fiber, it's a waste product anyway. And I, you know, think that ultimately it's going to biodegrade when it um, gets put into landfill. Um, it, if it has a high value, it may actually get pulled out and reused. And, and you know, those rigid bats are actually quite sort of structural. So when you peel your uh, cladding off or you peel your um, plaster bit off internally, there's nothing stopping you from pulling those out, packing them onto pallets and reusing them again. Um, glass wool is probably a bit difficult. It's um, they're difficult to handle. You know that you get itchiness. You need to wear PPE when you're handling it. Um, and whilst there's not a lot of actual sort of product in any given bat because it's so aerated, um, re in real terms, when you see a house being demolished, it all just goes off the landfill. Um, and uh, polystyrene, terrible product. You know that stuff's going to get broken up and get blown all over the place. Um, so yeah, I would definitely give consideration to the more um, environmentally friendly products, and don't be don't be persuaded by the marketing, the greenwashing that goes on. I think it's pretty clear that if you're looking at a natural product, whether it's hemp, um, straw, wood fiber, it's a it's a natural product, wool. But if you're talking about something that's heavily manufactured, like PIR, um, rock wool, glass wool, any of those things, they're going to be a problem down the track. Uh, maybe not for you, but it's for somebody else. I would add to that that um, one of the products, at least on the East States or around um, Queensland, at least, the polyester bats are made locally. They're made with 100% recycled plastics. Um, so theoretically, they would be recycled back again into the into sort of plastics recycling um, afterwards. Um, but you're right, it, it's... it's um, it's a complex issue of, of weighing up what's the least long-term environmental um, damage of any, any product that we use in, in all walks of our life. And it's a tricky thing, long life versus um, perhaps not being able to be used at the end of its life compared to a shorter life, but a lower embodied energy in that shorter life. Um, reusability versus recyclability versus disposal. Um, it's such a complex issue that we haven't really addressed in Australia. Yeah, I guess, and as you've both sort of pointed out, it really depends a lot on the way that, it, you know, if your house is demolished, the way that it gets demolished, you know, you can demolish your house carefully and recycle stuff or you can throw it all in a skip, which seems to be the way often. In, in Germany, in the building code, um, there's it, buildings don't get demolished, they get deconstructed. Oh, nice. Um, that's, that's good. It's a good approach. Um, look, I'm going to throw one more quick question in just because I didn't really touch this issue at all. And maybe it can be a quick one. And we've got two minutes before we finish questions. Uh, and it was from Catherine. And it's sort of about air tightness. But specifically, how do you prevent heat loss via extractor fans, same bathrooms and laundries? Um, you know, we need extractor fans. How do we manage those with the air tightness that we want in the house? Uh, I can answer from a passive house, and I suppose Matthew can too. Um, so extractor fans from range hoods and bathrooms and things like that, something you typically find in a non-airtight home. Um, and a non-airtight home kind of relies on um, leakage for the environment to remain somewhat healthy. Um, I'm not saying your home's healthy. I'm just saying it's somewhat healthy <laughs> because... Um, you know, uh, often homes have accidental air tightness by sealing around windows and things. But in general terms, you will get heat loss because when the air is being extracted, um, new air needs to come in to replace it or you're just depleting the, the room of um, oxygen effectively of air. Now in a passive house, um, we don't have extractor fans in bathrooms and we don't have um, range hoods that are ducted to the exterior. It's all part of the same system and it passes through um, heat recovery ventilation systems. So the heat is recovered from bathrooms and kitchens. Um, and then, and that heat is then transferred to fresh air that is brought in and circulated around the house. So um, what you're trying to create is a much more healthier um, environment um, than would you know, occur if you were just in a normal home. 
You're right. And you're like setting up a controlled ventilation system for the whole house rather than targeted ventilation at specific areas. That's really That's important. right. Did you have anything yeah. to add on that, um, Matthew? Um, I would so we lived in a, a weatherboard cottage that had sizable gaps in the floor. And as a comment to previous things, the walls were brilliantly insulated and the floor was not, and it was an ice box um, in the winter. But we couldn't keep the house at any temperature to save our lives, yet the CO2 levels would routinely hit 3,000 in, in, in an evening during the winter, which is well and truly into the range where it'll give you a headache. Um, even in, so we live in a, in a passive house now with the recovery of ventilation, even during lockdown when we've got four bodies in the house and no one's ever leaving at any point in the day, it's pretty hard to hit a thousand, although my teenage son does a pretty good job of generating CO2 at night. But yeah, it's been, the ventilation has been very good. And it, I mean, ventilation is something we're thinking more and more about in, in a COVID world. And certainly something you need to think about as you start making a house more airtight, not just because of fresh air, but also of moisture and CO2. Yeah, a lot to think about. Thanks for those answers. I am going to have to wrap up there. Thank you so much to all our panelists for the presentations and for the discussion and questions. Thank you to all the attendees for your awesome questions. Uh, it's a real shame that I couldn't get through all of them. Um, but, you know, we could do this for another two hours, but I'd, we'd, we'd probably get hungry after a while. So I'm going to pass back to Sophie to finish us off. Thanks so much, Dean. Um, that was so great. Thank you so much to our panelists and to everyone who spoke tonight. I, that was in a really informative session. Um, and before we go, I just want to remind you that we do have more expert sessions coming up and a free day of online sessions with our homeowners on the 17th of October. You can register for all those events and see all our homes open this year with their house tour videos at sustainablehouseday.com. I'd just like to thank our sponsors and our council partners for making Sustainable House Day possible. So thank you so much, everyone, and I hope you have a great evening.